three, two, one, go. Good morning hey. from me, from uh, good morning from uh, uh, the UK, from Bournemouth. Good afternoon to Australia, good afternoon to Malaysia, good afternoon to Asia. A very, very good morning to the US for those of you who are joining us um, from the US and the, uh, uh, and the American time zones. Uh, it is fantastic to be with you again. That's the second big webinar we're doing. And I really want to thank my colleagues for joining us today and particularly Gary Tan who organized that and Tete, who has helped uh, put this together, who is currently sleeping on the seven on the seven cloud. It must be about two or three o'clock in the morning where she is. And Rosita from Emerald in Malaysia, who is facilitating all that. So it's it's fantastic opportunity to get together and demystifying some of the issues related to publications. And I've asked um, uh, our associate editors that they are based in, in Asia, so it's a little bit um, uh, time friendly for them to come and join us today. Uh, as you know, we're doing this uh, webinars um, uh, regularly. So depending on where our associate editors are based, we're selecting different associate editors uh, each time. I'll start with the precious Catherine Prentice, Professor Catherine Prentice, who uh, join us from Brisbane. Bris am I am I right? You in Brisbane, Catherine, right? Yes, I'm in Brisbane. Yes. Fantastic, and with a new hairstyle that I think is the first time that people see that around the world. Uh, just just the new the new style and the new branding. Uh, then I've got Peter O'Connor, who is recovering from COVID, uh, but he's still very uh, strong and 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 fantastic uh, to contribute. Then we've got Noel Scott, uh, who looks happy in, uh, you're in Brisbane as well, Noel Scott, right? Correct, yes. Fantastic. Gary, where are you? Uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur, fantastic. And Simon is in Sydney, stuck in traffic, but he'll be joining us in the next uh, few minutes. So. Welcome to everybody. I can see almost almost 500 uh, people, and I can see uh, the attendees going up as as we speak. Um, I'd like to start sharing with you my screen and show you a few slides that I've prepared and I've I've uh, shared in different areas, and then I'm, I'll ask my colleagues to uh, to talk to you briefly uh, a couple of uh, about a couple of things that they are very critical in uh, in the publication uh, journey. And then we've got a lot of questions that have come forward to us. I think it's more than 100 questions. And I've asked Gary to um, to arrange them and manage them in a way that, uh, that the panel can answer. Uh, would like to keep this informal and would like to, uh, would like to make sure that everybody uh, can have the opportunity to ask questions. And uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Magic, I think I can share my screen. Amazing. Can you see my screen, Peter? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, Tourism Review, effectively, uh, it's the oldest uh, journal in tourism, started in 1946 uh, by uh, two very um, wise uh, people in Switzerland. And you can see that on the, uh, you can see the history on uh, volume 75, where we explained um, the history of the journal. I took over in 2017 as editor in chief, and we've got a fantastic editorial board. Many of you uh, that, that you have co corresponded already, and um, many people are joining us today. Um, the beautiful thing about Tourism Review is that we can publish a whole range of different uh, articles on, on many different areas. Um, because, of, uh, because of the nature of the journal, we are very inclusive, and therefore we are attracting papers on all kinds of areas, um, rather than uh, one specific uh, element of tourism. 
Um, this is some of the latest uh, results. We're on the 78 years of uh, publication. Uh, side score has grown dramatically in the last few uh, years, and now it's 12.8. Um, a couple of days ago, we got the size score tracker uh, for November 2023. That's already on 13.8. That means that it's going to be building until May, uh, and that's going to grow dramatically. Uh, impact factor for 2022 is uh, 7.8, and the five-year impact factor is 7.1. Um, and you can see the growth. You can see that in 2015, we had um, a quite low kind of numbers, and then over the years, um, we, we are building up. Uh, this slide's a little bit uh, older, but you can see how um, the citations have been growing and the publications have been growing. Uh, currently, uh, for 2023, we are publishing 80 papers. Uh, and from 20, I'm lying. In 2023, we'll publish 90 papers in, in nine volumes. Uh, and that is, um, we have been increasing the number of papers we publish because there's so many people who'd like to to publish with us. 2024 is almost covered, so we've already selected most of the 2024 papers. And in 2025, we'll be celebrating 80 years of uh, the Tourism Review, and it will be volume 80 for 80 years. You can see the rankings in uh, in different things, and you can see um, that uh, Tourism Review is on the top uh, 15 journals in tourism. And you can see this is the latest. It just came yesterday. You can see how um, um, downloads uh, have been growing over, over the years. And um, you can see that from 20 to, uh, 2019, we had one, 108. And uh, in 2022, we had double that, um, 2007. And, and again, in, in 2023, by including the September data, we had 199. So hopefully, it's going to reach to about 250 um, very soon. So please download and read uh, the Tourism Review because all the latest information is coming out. Um, this is where people are downloading from. Uh, obviously, China, um, United Kingdom, Australia, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Germany, US, Thailand, Spain. Um, I can predict that next year India will be uh, will be on this on this list, and uh, there'll be more people using the tourism review. You can see citations by year of citation. You can see the growth, uh, and that is reflected on the impact factors, and it's reflected on on how the journal is being used. And you can see uh, the growth of the journal in terms of how many articles are published per year. Um, what's, what's interesting is the submissions and what, what the submissions, um, how the submissions are growing. Uh, up to now, we've got about 780 submissions. I think this year we're going to go to more than eight uh, we're going to go to almost 1,000 submissions. That's the first time that we've got so many. Uh, and thank you for all of you who are contributing uh, papers to Tourism Review. And you can see the different um, um, papers that have been downloaded. And you can see um, the, the top articles in terms of immediacy with my friend uh, Metin Kozak, uh, who has got an incredible response to his COVID paper, uh, and then uh, and then you can see some of the other papers that have been uh, uh, responding uh, immediately, and and people are u are using them. Um, so I don't want to spend awful lot of time looking to lists, but very uh, a few things about the process and how this is working. I, I meet a lot of people, especially in Asia, that. They need three papers in order to graduate from their PhDs and in order to get their promotions and, and things like that. And quite often you find people that they would like to publish in an SSEI journal, uh, but they're not very focused. 
I think what we are trying to do in Tourism Review, and to be fair, all the editors around around the world in in different in different journals are all trying to do the same thing, trying to to publish the best research and uh, the great ideas. And the best research is um, it, it's, it's, it's journals, it's, it's articles that they are publishing uh, new theory, and they are making contribution both to practice and to and to theory. So when you are developing papers, your papers should start with a literature review that focuses on theoretical contributions and theoretical models. It needs to reflect the the latest information. Needs to reflect. Um, the latest publications, uh, sometimes we get papers that uh, they, they haven't updated their literature review. So a lot of the things that they're trying to do have been done already. Um, the paper should clarify the research gaps and uh, how to address them and should demonstrate originality and novelty, and novelty uh, both in, uh, both in, in theory in and theory also and in implication. Also in it's important to understand originality, and the originality should be um, very clear on the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion of the papers. So people will need to be, uh, the, the, the readers need to be immediately directed into why someone should read this paper and immediately should be uh, addressing uh, the things that they are, they are new. And there are some critical questions that um, that, that authors should always uh, consider before they are submitting. Have I really something new to say? What is the new knowledge and contribution to theory? Why is this paper significant and for whom? Who is interested to know and who should read this paper? What's the original contribution of this paper? Does the work add enough knowledge to the existing knowledge? Why someone will recommend this paper to, the, to their students? How does it uh, progress existing uh, global knowledge? Who will use this paper in their research? And who will benefit from reading, uh, from reading the paper? If you have studied in one location or industry, how can the paper benefit from other locations or other industries? And how can you justify the methodology? And are the results clearly articulated and understandable? And what will be the impact to economic, to, to academic research and, and industry? These are the questions that I'm always asking before making a decision whether to progress the paper or just reject the paper. I'll show you a very brief example. Um, and I will ask you to consider whether you'll publish this paper. Cultural and Religious Tourism in Romeri, Greece. Authentic experience and heritage contributions towards emotional reconnections with a historic heritage. Is this a real research or is that a fake research? In fact, Romeri is the village of my mother, and you can see here in the village. It's in the south of Greece in um, a very remote area. And that represents what I call the village of my mother syndrome, <coughs> where people uh, submit research that's only relevant to a very, very specific area and to a specific context. And that should be really only published in journals that they are dealing only with that particular context. And therefore, Tourism Review would have immediately rejected this. So you really need to look into how can your research have an impact across different areas and how you can maximize We seem to have lost Demetrius's sound. How about now? You, can you hear me, Peter? Yes, sir. Yeah. OK, thank you. So uh, what I was saying is that um, we really need to have uh, papers that they are contributing to theory and they are applicable to different contexts. And um, that means that we should um, have papers that they've got 
a wider context in, 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 in mind and being addressing issues in multiple locations. We're only looking for the golden egg that's going to make a good contribution. And the only way to do that is by reading the journal, downloading papers, reading them very carefully, and make sure that you engage with the journal. If you do not engage with the journal, it would be quite difficult to actually make a contribution. I recognize that um, really uh, problem solving and contribution to theory is a quite hard job and it needs, it needs a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, and quite often, you know, people are trying to um, do rapid publications. They try to do things that they'll get them immediate results. And this is normally uh, desk rejected in tourism review. So to get published, uh, you really need to write brilliant papers. You really need to engage with the journal and to understand what is the latest um, developments. And you really need to address the, um, the reports of the referees. And you really need to develop uh, the paper accordingly. You need to be able to recognize what's a good paper versus what's a toilet paper. And uh, you need to understand the process. So the process is very important. And, and, and um, this is reflected on this. So when a paper is submitted, um, I make a decision whether this should be reviewed or not. And then I'm sending that to associate editors who are dealing with different things. So the immediate, um, the, positive, the positive thing is to pass it on uh, to be refereed and uh, to get um, associate editors involved on in that. But sadly, 65% of the papers are rejected at this stage already, because we can see that this will not get the quality or the topic or the con on the context right, so they're never going to be uh, published in tourism review. So, and we don't want to keep these papers for longer than we need to. Occasionally, we ask the, the authors to redevelop something and resubmit the same new entry. And that is also part of the 65%. Uh, of the papers here. When you have the first reviews, 20 papers are reject 20 percent of the papers are rejected at this stage. And if you have about 65 plus 20, it gives you 85 papers, 85 percent of the papers. And what's happening for the for those 15 percent of the papers are going to this kind of circle of revisions where people are revising what the reviewers are saying and engage in conversation. Sometimes um, uh, this is one circle, um, the latest, uh, the, one of the, um, one of the uh, papers went up to eight different reviews um, before it was accepted. And, and both um, the authors and the reviewers were sticking to it to make sure that, that the paper um, was going through the process. And then once it's accepted, the paper is published, and then we're going to the next stage by public publicizing the paper and starting new papers. So I don't want to spend more time than that, um, so everybody can make a contribution, but please download uh, papers, read regularly, ask your students to read, review papers, submit papers, and invite um, and, and you have got an op open invitation to come and join and support you. Thank you very much. So somehow I need to stop sharing from here and go back to uh, our colleagues. How do you find that, Peter? Thank you so much. Who should go first? Ladies first. So do we go with Catherine? Uh, to share her views, and I've asked different people to to address different areas, uh, and I've asked Catherine to look into the theoretical contribution. You wanted me to talk about theoretical contribution? If you could. Okay, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I reviewed the lots of papers, and uh, I do find that um, um, the biggest problem for the submissions is that um, the minimal theoretical contributions and also authors confused about you know what it, what is considered as theoretical contribution and lots of papers as I, I read this talking about like uh, you know the research conduct in a certain country or in a certain sector for example you know in tourism 
but um, you know he'd been done somewhere else, so they they regarded that as theoretical contribution. So I think uh, this uh, these authors really need some uh, serious training about that to what is real theoretical contribution. They really underst should understand, um, you know, what is important in terms of research. Important, not necessarily. Um, um, sorry, what is interesting and interesting, not necessarily important. And what is important, not necessarily worth researching or significant enough to contribute to literature. So that's, that is something I think uh, anyone research should look into. And I reviewed so many papers, with so many papers, I really find this is the biggest issue in terms of theoretic contribution. And I feel that lots of authors get confused what it re really is. Uh, if we could have some kind of, you know, a training or um, yeah, workshop for these authors would be helpful. Otherwise, it's very wasting their time. That, you know, they spend lots of money, collect data, spend lots of time writing and collecting. Uh, sorry, uh, doing data analysis, but then we have to reject or that's 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 reject. It's really pitiful. So yeah, that's that's just my view and. Um, you know, interesting, important, important, and significant. The three words any authors or researchers should think about. Interesting, not necessarily important. Important, not necessarily significant in terms of the radical contribution. So interesting, I can talk a lot, but I want to be brief. <laughs> in, interesting, interesting um, important, and significant, three, three words. That's right. Yes, yes. Give me one so, second to say to Gary, uh, Simon is on the line. If you can, if we can bring Simon in, please, it will be wonderful. Hey. So, so interesting. Me. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Gary. And um, Catherine, when you get the paper from me as associate editor, how do you, do you decide whether it's interesting, important, and significant? What what are you looking for? Okay, well, obviously, first methodology. Methodology, you know, um, I think we tend to uh, reject papers, you know, with single study or survey based. And uh, um, in the second, I look at look, look at the abstract, <laughs> I read abstract first. So, you know, quickly look at what are the major findings and also the, you know, methodology of normally most papers, you know, they would have a couple of lines talking about methodology. And also just look at the abstract itself, the writing style and everything would give me an indicator of the quality of the paper. Then I quickly read the introduction. I will say how authors just justify the research gap, research significance. I feel that most authors are stuck with this, oh yeah, they find something interesting, they go ahead and do it. They, they don't really love the literature. They just jump to conclusion, yeah, this is something interesting to do it. But then, for example, not everyone talk about AI, they think AI is interesting, go and do it, but they're not, they, they don't really enough to understand you know what a research gap there, and then so they do it. That's interesting, right? Then um, whether it's important, some issues, but the, oh, most authors will say, "Oh, this has not been done, or this has not been researched. There's a research void." But doesn't mean this there's a research void is worth researching. So what if what do you do that? You know, how that can contribute to the literature, or you know, or at least you know can be utilized by practitioners. So they don't think. So to to do a meaningful paper you gotta think hard and you know myself i have you know i go for marathon run and the whole time i was thinking about research i have to think days and weeks before i actually started collecting data constructing model and you know writing so but i feel other other authors you know i feel that they're in a rush they just like most papers i feel is data driven they analyze data first whatever they can get you know and they start writing you know i think in general which is theory driven Think about theory first. I think this I learned from a law, law taught us uh, before, and you know, um, you know, it's become so popular these days. Researchers in the rush to get publish the papers, and they just data driven. You know, for analyst data, do some structure question more than you think. Oh, there's something, and then just write the rubbish, <laughs> mumbo jumbo I, everywhere. This is particularly, um, uh, particularly um, uh, evident in a lot of quantitative papers that um, that authors um, bring in 
they're really in a rush to to bring in data, analyze the data, and get their papers written before realizing what is actually they're writing and why. What is the significance of what they're writing? Yes, yes. They even don't understand what are variables should be uh, in a regression model, like structure equation model. They just throw everything there because they think, oh, this, based on the p-value, they think, oh, that's okay. That's significant. The p-value less than 0 0.05, they just report it. They don't think hard enough. You know, the significant doesn't mean it's meaningful or it's worth, you know, it's worth uh, reporting. So this is some, uh, something I noticed. I've read so many of them. I tend to just reject the papers like that. Uh, can we bring Noel into the discussion? And um, I have to admit that Noel sometimes uh, is sorry, my... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Prof, uh, si uh, who else? Uh? Simon um, Darcy. Yeah, 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 he's in. Uh, Prof, Simon, can you turn on your webcam? Simon, can you hear us, can you hear us first? Is in. Simon, there's a control panel which has both a microphone and a video control on it in a separate window. Okay, let's let Simon uh, be able to join us. Let's go with Noel, and and we'll um, we'll, we'll we'll keep um, an eye when Simon uh, join us. Mm -hmm. So I, I was saying that um, I've got to to confess that sometimes I I uh, use Noel as my sounding board. Sometimes if I'm not 100% sure um, whether I'd like to progress with a paper, I send that to Noel. And and quite often um, Noel is Noel is very good in 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 looking into different things and and come forward with 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 a recommendation. So. <laughs> Um, Noel, and that is particularly the case for bibliographical reviews. That it has become one of his specialization. I, th I think it started some years ago when he was doing the review editor or whatever we we used to call it. So, Noel, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Demetrius, and uh, I I I hope um, I'm a good sounding board. I. Uh, I, I I I do my best. Um, listen, so I want to I want to make a few points um, and perhaps step back a little bit to begin. So the reason people are writing papers is because they're academics. Academics think differently to consultants and other people um, because academics base their research on previous knowledge. So the whole purpose of being a, a, an academic is to build a body of knowledge. And that's called the, the literature. So when you do a literature review, you are reviewing or you must demonstrate that you have a good knowledge of the relevant previous literature. And not only that, you have to demonstrate, especially if you're doing a literature review study, that you are um, building on previous knowledge, that is identifying e problems with the existing literature. So if you're trying to, um, uh, so any paper, any paper that a person writes should identify an area or a problem that exists with the previous literature. And uh, a literature, um, and, and so usually you identify that by coming up with a good research question. Your research question says, hey, in the literature, I've noticed that there's this existing problem um, connected to say destination image or sustainability or something. I've reviewed the relevant papers and I noticed that there's this anomaly. Some people say this and some people say that, and I'm going to do some research to try and resolve that problem. Okay, so that's what we do as academics. Um, 
And so therefore, of course, doing a literature review is central. You can't, uh, uh, you can't do good research until, as you were saying, Demetrius and Catherine, you know the literature and you have shown that you understand it, you've identified some existing problem, and then you're going to uh, do some research. Now, the existing problem is not, doesn't stand alone. It's connected usually to some stream of literature. So if I'm, if I'm doing a, a literature review on destination image, I have to limit my scope to those relevant papers. I have to understand what's been written about destination image in the past, um, point to some anomaly or question, and then perhaps do um, either do some research uh, if it's an empirical paper, or if it's a literature review, review the options or the previous literature to try and understand why that problem exists. So that's what I think a literature review does. It's re reviewing the related literature about um, some existing problem that you have identified. And in your literature review, you then might review the various approaches to that problem and come out with some suggested new conceptual frameworks that reconciles the issues you've identified. So th that's what I think a literature should do. And of course, then this is why I get so angry about a systematic literature review. So systematic literature reviews um, are a fairly recent development, which have come, become very popular. Um, and they're sort of derived from medicine. So you see, in medicine, um, you're talking about drug trials. You're talking about very um, simple, um, or not simple, but very restricted results and your systematic literature review is designed essentially like a meta-analysis to determine if a drug is working or not, how effective it is. So you're just reviewing the existing literature. Um, what's happened when it's applied to business, a systematic literature review generally takes the form um, of I'm going to tell you about all the stuff that's been written about this topic, okay? And that is interesting. I would call that a scoping study. It's a way of saying, hey, I'm a PhD student. I need to look at this topic that's called destination image. And I, want to, I, I need to know and describe, because I'm doing a PhD, what's been written in this area. And as a PhD student, I need to identify research questions perhaps for my PhD, or I might identify gaps in the literature. So that's very good. That's a scoping study, which allows you to identify a good research question. But it's not publishable because it's not answering that research question. It's simply identifying one. So a scoping study or a typical systematic literature review is what often a PhD will do, or if you're doing research in a new area, you will do prior to beginning a good literature review on writing a good literature review. And I say that because the, system, the, the systematic literature review questions, remember every paper has got to have a good question. So the questions that I see in systematic literature reviews are, I'm gonna answer the, the serious scientific question of how many authors from different countries have written so, a paper on this topic, or I'm gonna write a, a paper on what type of methodologies, I'm gonna write a, a analyze how many uh, people use different types of methodologies, how many papers use different theories. This is what I would call mere counting. It's not serious synthesis and analysis of the literature. It's 
doing a descriptive, uh, 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 a top line descriptive study. To me, it's a little bit like writing a paper about your data sample if you're doing an empirical study. So you can't do that, but in a systematic literature review, you're usually analyzing metadata about the papers, keywords, authors, origins, and so on. And that's your sample. So you're describing the sample, you're not dealing with any serious scientific issues or um, issues. So, and then of course, you may do some sort of biblio a bibliometric study in a systematic literature review where you press a button and it comes based on the keywords that you've downloaded and it does some sort of nice picture on um, uh, uh, some cross, uh, cross correlation or um, uh, some sort of uh, study produces a picture which describes different types of papers without any intellectual input. So it's... And the worst pretty... thing on, on this, Noel, is that you cannot even read the picture because the picture has not been designed properly and has got all kinds of connections of things that you cannot see the, the, the connections. Uh, that, that really what annoys me. It's, it's a typical example of, um, you know, data-driven description without any um, serious attempts at, at content or synthesis, description of content. So, so therefore, when, when I see a systematic literature review, as when I'm reviewing any paper, I look at the contribution. And if the contribution says, oh, um, I've, my my contribution to knowledge is that there are people that there, there are no people in Africa who have written papers on this topic. I say, well, that's an interesting finding, but of absolutely no use to the study of destination image. Uh -huh. um, or if I see, uh, so that's one thing. A second criticism that I've got of systematic literature reviews, apart from starting um, with them starting without a good question is, and this is where I get into trouble, Demetrius, but I, I, I believe that tourism is a field of study. It's not a discipline. Therefore, every discipline has different assumptions. Sociology, anthropology, psychology, they all have different fundamental assumptions about how the world works and how you need to study it. So often in a systematic literature review, you grab all the theories and concepts together, no matter where they come from, and develop some sort of conceptual framework without thinking about the background of each one of those concepts. So if you, if you try and include social capital in, a st uh, in the same conceptual framework as uh, uh, decision, decision making, say individual decision making, something to do with that, you're, you're dealing with a societal level issue and an individual psychology issue and very difficult to group those together in any meaningful way. So the second lesson is apart from not doing or not trying to publish a standard, a standard literature, systematic literature review is, um, if you are doing an analysis of the literature, the, then do it, at, at least try and describe it, describe the literature or your topic based on the disciplines that people are using. Um, so, so I think, so for me in summary, systematic literature reviews, most of them are sort of like data-driven analysis of metadata without any content that produce gaps in the literature or, um, or, or areas of further research. Now, gaps in the literature and area of further research are ultimately opinions of the author. You can't prove that a gap in the literature is a gap in the literature without a significant review of that topic. So if you come up, if your question is, I want to identify research gaps in the literature, um, and you come up with what you think are good thing, good questions, your 
going to be rejected because that's just your opinion. It's the same as if you're doing a PhD in the section at the end, after you've written your contribution section, if you say, oh, and here are some areas for further research, the examiner stops. They don't have to read it because they recognize that in a PhD, anything in the areas for further research area is not examinable because it's not part of your research. It's, well, what am I going to do next sort of thing? So systematic literature reviews are generally designed to do things which aren't publishable. They are somewhat presumptuous. They're like saying, I'm a new researcher, but I I have now worked out what the gaps in the literature are and the areas for the research in my PhD. Everyone listen to me. You're not building or critically examining the existing literature to understand existing anomalies. If you do, so writing a good academic paper begins with a good literature review and um, and if if I see a paper which tries to make a contribution and can, and as Catherine could said, show that it's it's important, justified, and and uh, contribution, then I will bend over backwards to try and help that author publish their paper. But unfortunately, I don't see a lot of that at the moment. Thank I, you, Don. That's that's wonderful. If I can bring uh, Professor Gary Tan in to talk about two things briefly. One is what's a good methodology, and the second thing is how to achieve uh, a good impact. A few words, uh, Gary, and I know that you are anxious with uh, uh, bringing Simon in and bringing all the questions in, but a few words in, and then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the rest. Okay, uh, all right, all right. Uh, Prof, maybe before I start off, uh, just one question I wanted to ask uh, Prof Newell. Uh, very good topic on systematic literature review. Uh, but Prof, I, I have a very uh, question that I want to ask. Um, you know, I often receive a lot of rejection on systematic literature review, citing on one specific comment. This paper will not attract citation. So do you have any recommendation on how to make systematic literature review more citable? Oh, well, well, well I disagree. I, I do think um, one of the reasons why systematic literature reviews have become so popular is because some journals recognize that they do get citations, right? Um, so they are obviously, so systematic literature reviews are of interest to readers, but they're not making a contribution. Okay. So then, um, you know, so how can you change the, your, your, um, uh, an existing literature review or how can you make a systematic literature review more, more um, citable? Well, I don't think that's a good argument. How more, re let's say more relevant. Um, I think you should do that. Um, mm -hmm. I apologize, um, by coming up with a very specific question in your systematic literature review. See, systematic literature reviews, it's just a method. It's neither good nor bad. It's it, the, the, the key thing about systematic literature review is why are you doing it? If you're do, if trying to do it to count the number of people using this method, well, it's a waste of time. If you're doing it to select the appropriate literature to address some serious or previously identified anomaly in the literature, then that's reasonable. Uh, so uh, I'd have to talk to you more um, in depth about the specific type of literature reviews you're doing, and I'd be happy to do that. But it all comes back to, well, how do you justify the question that you're asking in in this literature review is important? So this is uh, a topic on its own almost. So Gary, uh, you cannot escape by asking other people <laughs> questions. So that's your time. Uh, if you can okay, tell okay. us so a bit. Yeah. 
All right. So let's uh, let's let's come to my part here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. okay. Uh, to to answer the first question about how to make your research more impactful. Uh, to me, I think the most important thing is the kind of topic that you're doing. Um, you know, often I've been asked by even my students, yeah, and in my colleagues, for example, what is a good, what is a hot topic. You know, what kind of topic that I can contribute that uh, has, you know, higher chances of paper being accepted. So I often, okay, propose this. Uh, if you want to have uh, a good topic, yeah, a hot topic, my first suggestion is look at special issue. Okay, uh, special issue often focus on emerging, yeah, very hot topic. So you should not, you should never be wrong, yeah, by looking at those call for special issue. Yeah, for example, some of the special issues uh, in tourism review, yeah, and etc. Now the, the other thing is about having, you know, like uh, attending discussion by practitioners, yeah, tourism practitioners. You know, whenever they share about a problem, that is going to be a hot topic that you know you can actually explore on. Yeah, so so this is uh, the first part that I will talk about. Uh, in, in terms of uh, methodology, I'm probably going to make it short. Um, I know that you know there are different methods that people are using. You know, some of us are uh, qualitative researchers, some of us are quantitative researchers, uh, some of us are mixed method, you know, and so on. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, for emerging scholars, uh, I think uh, you should start looking into another new approach uh, where we call it multi-data, multi-method approach. Yeah, so I think this is something worthy to explore because I do notice that uh, a lot of top journals are actually demanding for this new method. Okay, multi-data, multi-method techniques. Yeah. All right, thank you, Prof. Thank you. It's 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 right. Increasingly, we're looking to multiple studies before mm. you actually can submit the paper. Um, we are looking into: Have you done your literature? Have you done your qualitative? Have you done your quantitative? And sometimes. Um, sometimes increasingly we're looking to two or more rounds of study uh, to qualify mm -hmm. the research. Uh, I know that Simon is still struggling to come in. Uh, he has got some technical issues and I know our team is helping him. Thank you for that. Uh, and let me ask Peter to, to address um, the practicality and the practical implications because for those of you who know me, I always uh, trying to make sure that what we publish in academic journals uh, has got an impact in, in real life and supporting society. That's why uh, the global taxpayer is paying us to be able to think and create innovations that will enable us to, um, to make a contribution. So, Peter. Thanks, Demetrius. Um... So, uh, kind of, we're bouncing around the paper here. We've talked about many different areas. We've talked about the theoretical contributions. Um, we've talked a little bit, Gary mentioned about methodology and so on. Um, obviously, a typical paper is typically organized. You have an introduction, a literature review where you'll start to address the theory. Um, you'll have the research methodology. Uh, you'll lay out the findings of your paper. Um, and once you've done that, one of the critical sections of the paper that often gets neglected or overlooked, in my experience, is this uh, section towards the end of the implications, where you discuss how your findings are likely to impact the world. You need to, to explain what is the significance of your study and your findings for society, the economy, business, the consumer, whatever context that you're actually looking at and for other researchers. And it's this speculation, and I'll come back to this in a second, it really is speculation, um, which you make in good faith based on your data that constitute your study's implications. Now, like I said, this is a key section in uh, the paper, um, particularly I find in business and management papers. Um, in tourism review, we highlight both the practical and the theoretical implications of the paper. They're included in the structured um, abstract and uh, they're included in the guidelines for authors. And as Demetrius said, it's one of the topics that he's quite um, hot on making sure that uh, is included in papers. Because if you think about it, um, if you have a research paper that doesn't explain the importance of its finding, 
it basically exists in a vacuum. The findings may mean an awful lot to you and to a few other specialists, but they need to be put in context for the more general readership, that is the majority of the readership. Um, and like uh, Catherine was uh, talking about earlier on, you obviously need to include the theoretical implications, but I think it's also important to include practical or industry implications that show the, to use the word that Gary used earlier on, the impact of our actual research. And demonstrating the impact of our research is something that's become very much a hot topic as well, with accreditation agencies like AACSB and Equus increasingly asking um, schools to show the impact of their studies, of the studies of their faculty members and so on. So what exactly do we mean by implications? Um, implications are basically conclusions that you can logically infer from the study's findings. And obviously, if we're talking about practical implications, we're talking about the uh, conclusions that you can draw, uh, which are going to have implications for practice. Now, you can't predict how this is going to occur. Um, basically, what you've got to try and do is draw logical implications that are based on the findings of your study. And I think this is a very another very common error that we often see. People present their findings, they start to talk about the implications of the findings, and they launch into an entire discussion about the topic, which has absolutely nothing to do with either the study that they actually composed, or in particular, the findings that they actually arrived at during the study. So I think it's quite important to actually focus on what your study is about, what your findings have actually shown, and then try to speculate and assess what the implications are for practice. Um, I think it's also important to differentiate them for recommendations. Recommendations are actions or, or, or subsequent steps that, in your opinion, need to be taken because your findings suggest this. But it's, it's, a, it's another area that needs to be included. Um, it's not exactly the same as practical implications. That's it, Dee. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, I think we've got the first round and we are almost one hour on, uh, on air. And it's a great opportunity to actually um, start taking some of, the, some of the questions that people have sent to us and um, start um, having a, an open conversation effectively between us to answer any questions that people have. What's the, what, what, what's the word? Ask any questions you want to ask, but you were afraid to ask or, or, or whatever. And, um, and have a, an open conversation to help people understand how they can be much more successful when they're sending papers to tours review. Uh, really, you know, when you get almost 1,000 papers and 650 of them are desk rejected uh, half an hour after I start reading them, it's awfully a lot of effort being wasted, really. And and the more we can help authors to make sure that they are successful, the more uh, the more we'll make a contribution uh, to society. So, Gary. Um, do you like to start with some of the questions we have got and, and see what we, what we can do? Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Prof. So I'm going to start off with the uh, first question. So this question is also uh, in our list. Uh, how do you identify a good research topic in tourism? Noel, do you like Anyone? to start with that? You, you started talking about that early on. Oh, yes. And uh, again, I... I may be a little bit controversial. Um, uh, I think there's some cultural issues here. I think that um, hot topics um, uh, in, for example, China are very important because the government um, uh, is direct directs funding towards topics which it thinks are very important. Okay, so hot topics are very practical, usually, uh, but they're not often necessarily related to theory. 
and to making contributions to theory. So there's a sort of a divide here. Um, some people, some academics think that um, good topics are based around theory. And in other places, so perhaps uh, in IT or in some other areas which are um, happening very quickly with lots of new amazing ideas, artificial intelligence, then hot topics are really important. But if you come back over to other areas, that, for example, the area that I'm interested in, which is psychology, you might say that there's not much that's new, okay? That, um, that there are certainly new contexts. Um, let's say why people become veg vegetarians. That's an, that might be an interesting hot topic, but the theory below it, the theory that you use to explain why that's occurring, um, is probably going to be um, uh, uh, in behavioral sciences well defined, or in sociology, it's well defined, um, or it it would probably be in the original discipline. That is in, and and the only issue would be is how much of that really good theory that is current and used in psychology is actually applied over here in this field of study of tourism. So for me, the best questions, the ones that I've found most interesting, specifically related to psychology, are about the difference between the theories that are used in tourism to explain things and the theories that are used in psychology, the original discipline to explain something. And I've noticed a big gap. I've noticed a gap between uh, the sort of theories that people in psychology, my specific area, cognitive psychology, use today to explain things, and the theories that we use in tourism, um, which tend to be 40 years out of date. So for me, the most interesting hot topic is applying theories um, from cognitive psychology to explain things in tourism, which are um, not well explained by the theories we're using at the moment. Now, that's a particular issue, but I do think that hot topics like IT aside, in more established areas, perhaps like psychology, sociology, and so on, um, hot topics are really just that. They're topics. They're not related to the existing theories. They're applications area. And, and so I would suggest that you don't, you're not picking a topic to do research on because it's necessarily new. In fact, the best research might be taking something that's very well established, like destination image or uh, decision making, and changing the way we think about it using some ideas from psychology that haven't been applied before and which have been proven successful. Thank you, Nord. My approach to hot topics is, is impact, really. How many people and how many um, uh, uh, um, government societies can benefit from this? This really guides my decision. And if it's a destination image, and if someone is doing a new research on destination image, and if it's really revolutionary and changes the way we're doing things, I really want someone to come forward and say, uh, to provide good evidence that this is new and, and, and actually make a huge impact uh, around the world in, in, different, in different countries and different contexts. So for me, it's really about um, a hot topic is, is something that's going to change the, the life, uh, the benefits, the impact on a on 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 a big scale that is that is what what i i call a hot topic may i just right. follow on there oh well, please please peter oh, sorry no this will be very brief actually just to add to that demetrius i fully agree with you and i fully agree with noel as well it, it, it needs to have solid uh theoretical background um 
it has to have impact. But when you're searching for a hot topic, one of the key things you got to do is you got to make sure it's something that interests you. Um, because when you put yourself down a stream of research, uh, you're probably going to spend several years reading about and writing about this particular topic. So it better be something that interests you, that you're passionate about, that you feel is actually going to make a difference. Uh, because otherwise, you're going to become very bored with it and frustrated very, very quickly. No. Absolutely. The only the only thing is is not to have the village of my mother, hmm. because I'm very I'm very passionate about the village of my mother, but nobody else is. Uh, and therefore, I cannot I cannot publish it uh, in in tourism review. So it 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 are you absolutely right with it? It needs to sustain interest, and you need you also need um, what I find occasionally is this opportunistic behavior that uh, people have seen something about the metaverse, and now everybody would like to publish about the metaverse. They've never done any work on on tourism and technology before. They've never looked into the real impact on you know on decision making, uh, how technology is supporting decision making, how technology is supporting a, a, a supporting uh, promotion, marketing, distribution. But all of a sudden, metaverse is happening, and all of a sudden, I'll do a paper on that as well because guess what? Um, it may it may get citations or it may get published quickly. Um, Having said that, let me let me give you another insight. On topics that I recognize as editor in chief, that um, they've got a huge interest and and potentially a huge uh, impact to society, we go fast track. Um, I know that. I think the paper on ChatGPT, the first paper on ChatGPT that we published in Tourism Review. I think I uh, I think the reviewing process with two or three reviewing uh, uh, stages was about 14 days. The first paper we published on Metaverse, I think the reviewing process was eight days. Why? Because I recognized how important it was and I recognized that uh, uh, the impact that that would have. And I've asked, I've asked members of the editorial board and associate editors to actually fast track um, the reviewing process. If someone, if something comes to me and it's talking about sustainability and the impact that is so incremental that does not really um, have a huge impact in society immediately, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna take its its course. By the way, we normally we make a decision within 32 days, uh, and n normally the desk rejection process. Uh, is within a day or two. Sometimes, like this period, I've been traveling a lot. I've been doing a lot of conferences around the world, so it's it's probably going to take four or five days for people to know if if their paper has got legs and whether I'm going to take that forward or whether um, we're going to desk reject it. I'm very keen to desk reject papers that they are not going to be published in tourism review uh, because I don't want to keep them in tourism review forever. You know, there are some. There are some journals where I'm, I'm submitting my papers and they are waiting for six months to tell you whether they will they'll proceed with your paper or not. So especially if especially if it's a hot topic, I really want to take that forward very quickly to make sure that society benefits earlier rather than later. And between us, there's, a, there's almost a, a healthy competition between uh, journal editors to make sure that we bring first uh, the most important things. It's like the, it's like the journalists uh, and like the, the new media where um, you really want to bring the news first than, than, than other, other outlets. So hot topics, things that they are making a, a, a big impact to, to society. And if it's really hot, we are prepared to go really fast on tourism review and get it out very quickly. Uh, because it really would like to bring the the contribution to society. So let's get the the next question, Gary. And now we lost Gary. Well, Some 
Well, while we're waiting, Demetrius, I, I, first of all, I'd like to say I would like to visit your mother's village, and uh, so I, 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 I'd love to uh, one day. Um, just to flow on before Gary comes back with the next question, um, contribution, you were talking about contribution, and I do think it's obviously important. That's why people in government talk about impact these days, because they're saying, well, why the hell are you doing this research? What's the outcome? But, uh, and and the the impact, the requirement for um, people, especially in business, to write an impact statement or to be able to um, uh, provide an impact statement is um, especially important because, of course, most papers don't make an make an intro. So, if there's another lesson for people when you're writing the paper. You can choose again two ways: make a make an impact, um, practical impact. That'd be really good, along with a small academic contribution or a significant academic contribution, perhaps with a small practical one. But you don't have to. Uh, but if you only make a practical contribution, me being a bit of an old school person would find it interesting, but I think it would therefore go into a um, uh, industry journal or a newspaper. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. It, it needs to have a bit of both. Let me bring something else to the discussion, um, which I, I find increasingly bothering me. And it's a little bit of uh, um, issues related with ethics and issues related to authors. Let me bring Catherine here and um, ask you, how many authors do you think a paper should have? I, I get some papers that they've got about, I don't know, uh, has got six or seven or eight authors. And I'm wondering, has everybody contributed to this paper? How can seven papers contribute to 6,000 words? You know, they're right. And I'm not talking about some of the reviews papers that we have written recently, you know, with 40 authors, but these are different kind of um, uh, speculative, if you like, editorials that we are we are opening a new area. But in a in a normal research paper, sometimes I find six, seven, eight authors, and I'm wondering what is going on there. Catherine, what's your experience? Catherine, you are muted. You are muted. Catherine, we cannot hear you. Okay, I'm just going to be blunt and uh, and. Uh, um, That's frank. why I'm asking you, Catherine. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, I I'm not a because I have any uh, research, you guys. What you have done? So I'm just offering my own personal opinion, not being offensive to anyone. Okay. Uh, I don't think a paper a paper should be more than three authors unless it's some special research, like medical research. When I say a paper, like especially for tourism, more than three paper, more than three authors, unless some special, oh, you know, circumstance like a supervise, a supervisor, a super, supervision, like um, multiple supervisors, of a different case. In general, for a normal paper with more than three pa three authors, I really wonder what the fourth, fourth or fifth authors do. So this is something I always question, and then myself. Just my personal opinion, okay, and <laughs> I don't want to be offended in any so Myself, I would refuse to be involved in a paper that uh, put me, um, you know, more than three authors, paper like that. And so I, I tended to um, need, I tended to, you know, take a need for a paper, do whatever I can, unless it's um, for my PhD students. So that's the, you know, that's something, um, you know, I have to mentor. Otherwise, for any papers I do, I initiate, I always need, I always I make sure not more than three, three authors. I feel the fourth author, fifth author, they just really not a, <laughs> probably for, I don't know, a different share, stage. We, we share a very common kind of um, uh, experience that when you've got four or five authors, you say, why do we have um, so many authors? And what's the contribution? And actually, it's a good opportunity to explain to people and in Tourism Review, we are asking people to, to specify what each author has done. And something I'd also like to say here is that we locked the system about a year ago because we had a situation where people were changing authors, they were trying to add authors at the later stage and they were doing a lot of unethical, unethical um, uh, practices. 
So we had one or one author, corresponding author, that he wanted to add three authors at R2, meaning that you know the paper had done through two reviews and uh, someone was uh, trying to bring two more authors in, uh, three more authors into the paper. Obviously, this is unethical behavior, and we don't allow it anymore. So for those people who are attending uh, today, is make sure that um, the authorship order, all the authors are included from the beginning, because when you have completed the a paper, it's already, you have done the research, right? And um, the authorship um, order is in place because we will not allow people to change the authorship authors, uh, the authorship order, or to add new authors into research later on. It's very unusual that sometimes that we are asking for very specific um, techniques and, and, and methodologies to be added, where someone can say, yeah, I brought Professor Garitan because he's an expert on this and that, and therefore uh, we would like to add one uh, more author. But in that case, we are asking for awfully a lot of evidence to demonstrate that this author um, uh, needs to be included in the authorship team. Gary, do you have more questions for us? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a few repeated questions uh, related to chat GPT. So uh, many have asked your opinion on using chat GPT. How far can we use chat GPT in our research? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I think chat GPT and artificial intelligence is a reality. And um, I think people will be using it to get some ideas, to engage in some kind of uh, scoping of the paper. But I think it's totally unacceptable to get chat GPT generated content in the, in, in, in the journal articles. And um, because, you know, um, chat GPT does not have original contribution. So by definition, it would not be an original contribution. Therefore, I don't think it should, it should be coming in there. Catherine, do you use yes. chat GPT? No, never. never. I, use, I know how to use it. I know how to use it. I use it just for fun when I test it, but I'll never use it for research. I don't think it's good enough. <laughs> OK. Peter? I mean like to read. Yeah. Uh, I, I read on Scholar Google. I probably read every time I write a paper, I can read 50 articles a day. I just read and read on one screen and one screen to data analysis, one screen just to write him. So I don't do, I don't use chat GPT. Chat GPT. I, I, I haven't found it's good enough for me. This is my personal opinion. <laughs> Demetrius, just a reminder that in our author's guidelines, we do have AI, generative AI usage key principles, um, where we talk about the fact that you cannot use chat GPT or equivalent to generate any of the copy results, statistics, or summaries of the article. So people may be using it for inspiration. Um, I've certainly experimented with it, uh, particularly ChatGPT4, where you can feed a spreadsheet up there and you can ask it basically, here, analyze this data and tell me what you find. Um, and it will come up with some interesting um, analyses. Um, but uh, uh, just like Catherine said, it's not going to come up with anything original. Uh, it's not going to come up with anything innovative. Uh, it can take some of the legwork out, but I personally would recommend um, uh, double, triple, and quadruple checking anything you get out of these generative AI um, uh, systems. I, I used it recently um, to write a, a short uh, summary paper as an experiment, and I was really, really happy because it cited me multiple times. And then I looked at the citations, and they were with authors that I've never written with and papers that have never been published. But on the surface, it looked like a really, really good uh, research paper. Yeah, you, you receive some of the papers and you can see that, first of all, now we've got software and uh, um, and, 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 and uh, systems that they are picking these things up because obviously they're using existing text. 
uh, and and that becomes obvious. So I get some red alerts when uh, we get papers uh, that they are using these things. And um, the other thing is that it it on the surface it reads fine, but when you're looking into the details of it, it's actually quite um, uh, quite laughable. Often the text is quite laughable, or it's 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 very um, it, it's very surface-based analysis. So um, not only we reject on on ethical grounds, but we also we reject on the, on the level of of analysis and the level and the level of of contribution. Gary, next question. I know the time flies when we have an interesting conversation. Okay. Um, next question. Yeah, we, we have probably another 30 minutes. Yeah, so uh, probably we get on to the next question. Um, all right, the next question probably is quite, uh, uh, is basically about uh, how do you really write a good paper? Because we have lots of questions about how to actually write a quality paper. I think the quality paper, it, it uh, for me, it, I'm, I'm very particular with the topic and very particular on the contribution. If the paper does not make a good contribution, there's no pay, there's no point of really spending awful lot of time printing it. Don't forget that I, you know, hopefully this year will also will probably end up close to 1000 papers. I can only publish 90 papers. So I only I can only publish 10% of the papers I received. So one in 10. So I've got to make sure that we understand um, which are the papers that they can go forward. The other thing is, I've got so much work for my associate editors and for my reviewers that I need to be selective which papers to ask them to work on. And and that is something that's really, really important that we have got to explain, that a paper receives about 20 hours of feedback, 20 hours of very qualified people's time consultancy or, or or feedback work because what happens is that when a paper comes in it is then going out to probably about 10 to 15 reviewers and we're asking them can you please review this paper i'm expecting on the first revision the first <laughs> review to get about four to five reviews good reviews back before i can make a decision and why do we do that? Because we like by the end of the revision process to still have two or three reviewers with us to make the final decision of accept or reject. So what's happening is that uh, papers are coming in, 65% of the papers are being rejected immediately by me. Then we are sending out about uh 35 percent of the papers that we receive so 350 papers imagine out of the 1000 are going to go to associate editors and reviewers to be reviewed and they're gonna go out to uh normally about 10 to 15 um uh, potential reviewers in one particular paper that i remember it went out to 37 potential reviewers to make sure that we get four good reviews back. So for those of you who are attending this, please volunteer yourself to review papers and make sure that when you receive an invitation to review papers, especially from Catherine and from Noel, make sure that you accept that and you make sure that you do a good review. Make sure that the review is honest, helpful, and substantial if you if, if someone writes a review and says i hated this paper i really didn't like it with this we black list the review and we black list the reviewer because it doesn't take the 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 system seriously and they expect to receive reviews but they are not willing to contribute so in a situation so each paper gets about 20 hours uh, 20 um, reviews, which take multiple hours for people to write uh, before it can be finally accepted. So in that case, we need all the 
the community to make a contribution to the reviewing process because at the same time they're receiving but they also need to put back into 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 the top in into the system um so that is the process and how uh papers get uh, get get uh, through this process Demetrius, I'm just following on from that. You know, the, the question is an interesting one. Um, the people, normally, if you wanted an, an answer to that question, you wouldn't ask people in a journal. You would typically ask your supervisor, if you're a PhD student, or other colleagues in your university or in your department or people you know. And, and so I think the question really reflects that there's a whole body, a, a whole group cohort of, um, of people writing academic papers who don't have that training. Something's happened, they're, they're either PhD students or, um, or people who've got their uh, doctorate, but haven't really had a lot of good training in writing papers. That's part of what you do. So um, I, I guess that means that um, uh, in some countries, the research cultures aren't well developed um, or the requirement for writing papers hasn't developed, is, is developing now. People are not under pressure. One of the, one of the, uh, the real issues that I am sort of starting to pick up on is that a student will often um, have to write a paper and their supervisor perhaps says to them, put it in and get some comments and then you can improve it. So in essence, what's happening is the journals are providing supervisory support to students who aren't getting good supervision from their PhD supervisors. So it's an issue. Hopefully in five, 10 years, it will go away because there'll be a, a greater cohort of people who are well-trained, but that's why you're seeing so many questions at the moment. It's an, it's a... Yeah, I think, I think Noel, you're right. As, as editor-in-chief, um, I see myself as a gain, gate opener, but also as a gatekeeper. So if, if I get a if I get a bad paper that someone has not taken the time or doesn't have the skill to develop or does not have not asked the supervisor uh, if a PhD student or a couple of senior colleagues in their faculty to help them develop the paper, I'm not prepared to get um, reviewers to actually do the work for them. So it's typically desk rejected. Sixty five percent. Six six hundred fifty papers. They are rejected within half an hour from when I open them. That is a lot of wasted effort. And it, the more we can make sure that people understand what we're doing and how we're doing it, the more they do not waste their time in creating something that doesn't have legs. So in reality, what we're trying to do, and I don't know how long it takes you to write a a paper. It takes me uh, a couple of months. And, and and with colleagues and with meetings and with with most of you who have written papers together. So I don't want um, you know I don't want effectively if we are writing with three pay with three people six months worth of work to be rejected in half an hour. So what needs to be submitted needs to be of good quality and needs to have a, a legs and needs to have a contribution so we can go forward. I know we can discuss a lot of these things for much longer, but I'm I'm keen that we cover as many questions as as we can have, Gary. Can't hear you, Gary. Okay, I'm sorry, I have been muted. Okay, yeah. uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. So, uh, someone actually asked about article processing charges and whether these article processing charges actually leads to higher chances of paper being accepted okay. and also towards the credibility of a journal. Okay, um, Tourism Review does not charge authors to publish. So, there is nothing that they need to pay and therefore, um, this discussion about uh, charges does not apply. Having said that, um, 
authors can apply for open access. Uh, so they then someone pays. Either they pay, their project is paying, or their government is paying, or different different uh, organizations are paying. It does not make any any impact uh, in the reviewing process. What happens is at the end, when the paper is accepted uh, and they need to sign the, I think it's the copyright transfer, it's at that stage that the journal is asking, would you like to publish it as open access? There are some transformative agreements in several countries where if you are publishing out of this country and you are the corresponding author, your paper can be published open access for, for free. Um, or it's part of the the university or the government agreement with, with Emerald. Um, to be a perfectly honest with you, we would like that. We would like as many papers to be open access because the more open access the paper it is, the more uh, able people are out there to read it and the more impact has got and it makes a it makes a difference and we really want people to um to publish open access i think on the final um acceptance letter on the on the template there is a text that says have a look on these countries to see if you can publish your work on open access and in some other countries, typically developing countries, um, there are discounted rates on how to publish open access. Um, now that someone raises that, um, we have seen several journals, especially in the last four, uh, five years, to charge uh, authors to publish. And we've seen a lot of desperate people sending papers to desperate journals, paying a considerable amount of money uh, for publication. We also have seen these journals offering um, guest editor positions to various people um, in order to be able to go and recruit uh, people who will pay them to publish their papers. This has nothing to do with Tourism Review. Tourism Review does not charge to publish your paper. It publishes the best papers we have got and most of the top journals are in the same situation. Uh, Peter, Noel, you'd like to take that, Catherine? Any more contributions? Not no, really. I, but i am just uh, point out, uh, Demetrius, that in some other areas of management, like, for example, finance and accounting, um, authors have to pay to actually submit papers to journals. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a submission fee, which can be $250, $500, before it even enters into the review process. Uh, so we in the tourism field, we're, we're quite lucky. Um, one of the things that does is stopping exactly what Noel was talking about earlier on, uh, which is people sending in papers which are underdeveloped in order to get feedback to actually understand the way in which they should actually be developing them. Because if they had to pay uh, each time they submitted, then um, it would be a different ballgame. Okay. Gary, next question. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, basically, I have two. Uh, this question, uh, I've seen it repeated uh, a few times. Someone is asking about conceptual paper. Is this something that Tourism Review is still looking for? So that's the first question. The second question is specifically for Prof. De Vitros. Uh, someone is asking whether a specific country, for example, a case study in a single country, would that be an interest for tourism review? Okay, uh, let me answer both of these um, questions very quickly. Um, I would, first of all, before I try to publish in tourism review, I will ask people to read the call for papers and the instructions to authors. And if they read the instructions to authors and the call for papers, they'll have the answers that they're they are asking for. So there are no shortcuts. Please read. If it is on the, and the answer is yes, we have various various categories there that, that um, conceptual papers are part of that. The issue with conceptual papers, they really need to be conceptual papers and they need to prove that there's, there's contribution. If there's no contribution, there's no publication. Uh, is it, if it's in a particular country or not, that has got again the with the issue with 
the the village of my mother does a contrib does a, a research that happened in a small village in Finland make a contribution that someone in Australia, someone in Malaysia, someone in Indonesia, some in in Brazil going to use or not? That is that is ultimately the decision that we have got to make. So if there's no contribution and if people cannot use in different places, um, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be published. It can be it can be the research can happen in a particular context, but then needs to contribute to theory and needs to contribute to practice that will be globally uh, useful. Next question. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Now, next question is uh, how to increase citation. How to increase citation? I know nothing about it. Uh, uh, can so, I jump in here? Yeah, can I you jump can. in here? It's, it's very, very simple how you increase citations. Write about interesting things, do the paper very, very well, have interesting and important results. And you know what? If you publish in a top quality journal like Tourism Review, you will get cited. But if you yeah. publish about boring things and have very little contribution, either you won't get published or else the paper will just sit there. I'll, I'll echo what Peter is saying. And what I'll do is I'll add the element of time. Do all these things before every, everybody else. The, the paper that an, um, Metin Kozak published on COVID we're just on time and it was it was spot on that's why it has been so well cited if you're sending me a paper about covid right now i'm not going to publish it because very few people are looking for papers on covid and very few people will be citing covid papers Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so I have another question, probably this question, uh, I will address this to uh, Peter. Uh, earlier you were talking about some uh, Africa, so there were some questions related to this. Uh, what advice would you give African researcher about writing about Africa and making our research work more appealing uh, and relevant to international journals? I think I think Africa um, would like to see more African um, uh, authors to come forward and publish in Tourism Review, and we actively seeking to find the thought leaders from Africa to make sure that they are represented because we are a global global journal. Um, but again, the same principle applies. It cannot be for a small village in Ghana that something that's only specific to Ghana or to uh, Kenya or to Nigeria or wherever it is in Africa. It needs to be something that's happening in Africa that 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 people are um, are looking to this context, and then from there we can expand and and it can have a global global impact. There are a lot of issues in Africa that are related with communities. There are a lot of issues related with animal welfare. There's a lot of issues about safaris. There are a lot of issues about, about safety, security, that we can learn from Africa for different other areas. But there are, uh, there are a lot of um, issues that are only related to Africa and this particular context. So in if you've got a very specific thing that's African-related, it will go to the Journal of African Studies not into tourism review but if it's a if it's a paper that is has been studied in africa on an issue that has got in, in a global implications let's say whatever has happened in africa can have can help a brazilian policy maker or can help a brazilian researcher or indonesian researcher that's exactly what we are what we are supporting there's another another issue specifically in africa that many Many academics in Africa do not have access to tourism review in a way that we have got in some other in some other regions, either because they don't subscribe to the journal or their technology is not um, uh, up to date or whatever. Quite often, what we do is we we will support African researchers if they send me a, a if they send me a message and say, "Can you please support us in a couple of things." We're trying to make this as as um, 
as as inclusive as possible by 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 supporting them a little bit more than others. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have three questions uh, related to selecting a journal. Um, how can you actually, you know, select a journal for your work? Catherine, how do you select journals to publish? Okay, I just offer my personal opinion. Uh, first, obviously, look at the ranking. So look at the Shimago ranking and as well as Australia's ABC ranking, uh, depending, you know, depending what's the purpose. And that's the first. The second, I look for the editors. So I particularly, um, I like to do research on all the chief editors, say what they've been publishing in the last five years and last two years. Um, editors like you working very hard, respond very fast. That's the that's my favorite. And I'm not trying to flatter you. That's I mean that. And if you look at editors, and the, you know they have been published the last five years, and you can see they've been very. And I don't know what's word to describe. If they're not active, how can they be good? I mean, how can they really be? responsive to uh, authors and then sometimes we publish paper a submit sub, submitted paper took like them you know a year to respond to something you know i submitted two papers to jbr since arch woodside left to jbr and it's a disaster that journal just like they don't respond i submitted last year still hasn't gone got the first review back so my second uh, option my second um yes option is just to choose editors it is very important you know and, and you know look at this Citations, the activity, the responsiveness, and even the personality. Like I look at you, virtual your 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 posts in social media. What do you say? What do I know? You care. You have passion. So this is this is the type of editor I look for. And I often advise my PhD students as well. You choose the journal, even the journal is so good and the impact factor, all of that. But then they change editors, change the editor board, and then the disaster. And then getting response. And we want our, our work to be read, to be cited. We don't want it to take forever for the reviewing process. And then, like, like you, sometimes I send you an email or you respond straight away, even your midnight, you don't care what time, you always, always respond. So you are the model editor for all people you know, to look at. Thank up you, Catherine. That's, I'll I mean buy you that. a huge drink. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> and I just realized, just like, um, so another, like, you know, some journals in marketing as well, like uh, journal retaining and consumer behavior. Harry, you know, he's fantastic editor as well. He responded very quick. He say what he says. He does what he says. He deliver what he promises. But some editors, my God. So no matter how good the paper is, if you sit in the reviewing process forever, what's the point? You know, we want a quick turnout. We want it to keep, you know, keep um, researching and, and something new, some cutting edge. Cutting edge is going to be, you know, not, not, it's not going to last forever, right? Some new research is not, not going to last forever. We want it to get published and read. No, so, yes. how do you select? Um, I, I always recommend um, finding the journal which is discussing the issue the most. So um, uh, if you look at the reference list that you've got for your paper, and you're starting to see that many of your citations or your references are coming from a particular journal, then that's an obvious um, target for you to send your paper to. The reason is that um, editors want um, uh, citations. So if they're publishing a paper which cites lots of their own journal, that's good. Um, it also means that um, if if papers, if you're publishing um, or you're trying to submit to a journal which has already published papers on the topic, the editor will find it easier to find reviewers. So there's a there's so and and conversely, if you're submitting to a journal um, and you haven't got many of those papers from that journal think to yourself well maybe i'm missing some maybe there are some papers from that journal that i should put in so um and and if there's not if there's no connection in the citations between your paper and the journal that you're submitted well then it's the wrong journal yeah but I, we do have i think lots of journals uh, you know our papers will fit in um, we have lots of similarity in terms of journals like tourism and hospitality or marketing, you know, lots of similarity. Uh, so I think, yes, it's more than just that. That's my opinion, anyway. <laughs> Peter, how do you select journals? 
Um, I think I'm going to be repeating here a little bit. Um, I would go with so the... Just, just go into something What in addition to. Yeah, I, I, I'll just add it. I'll, I'll put in, like like Catherine, I think the ABDC list is very important for us here in, uh, in Australia because it determines things like promotion and brownie points and so on. Um, for me, the biggest two issues are... Um, the match of the paper with the journal itself. I publish in both tourism and hospitality, and there's some papers that just clearly fit in one or the other. Um, and then I think the speed issue um, is really critical. Um, speed of desk reject, as Demetrius has talked about earlier on, the speed of the review process, um, and then the speed of publication afterwards. Um, and I think most of us have a situation where we have papers which are sitting in review for six months, nine months, then you get it back and then you have, say, three months to do it and then it goes in for another six month process. And then if the paper gets accepted, it doesn't appear even in online first for another six months to a year. So you've gone into a two, two and a half year process, uh, which is very, very frustrating, particularly if you're trying to get citations and, and get impact as well. Uh, really important uh, that I'm not sure if a lot of people understand this, but uh, Tourism Review has got a benchmark of 150 days up to final acceptance. Uh, 150 days, five months from the submission to final acceptance. Of course, a lot of these things depend on how fast the authors doing reviews. Uh, but we have got 150 days, uh, five months benchmark. If it's more than five months, um, a, red, a red light uh, turns on into some of my uh, on my dashboard and say this this paper has been uh, with you for more than five months. Um, and normally it takes about three weeks to get it out uh, online. One of the one of the things that we do is we translate the uh, article. We translate journal abstracts into Chinese and into uh, Spanish. That has delayed a little bit the process, especially if the authors cannot provide the first, uh, the first um, uh, original Chinese or Spanish um, abstract. So we are always advising authors to find Chinese and uh, Spanish um, uh, translators or colleagues who speak the language, who can do the abstract, that speeds up the process. Otherwise, we are asking our colleagues, uh, associate editors who are dealing with these languages to actually translate the article and that can take a little bit longer to see the article published if, if that is, is needed. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, we have about 10 more minutes, uh, so I'm probably going to take the last two questions. So the first question is, uh, any strategies for young researchers to collaborate with international well-known authors? And finally, the last question is, any advice for young researchers? Okay, uh, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine, um, Catherine being the youngest, <laughs> youngest <laughs> uh, oh i always encourage i always encourage um uh, when i review papers and i feel some you know some of the uh, data are very good and then the writing uh really poor so often i make comments or suggest to uh, authors to find some more from you know senior research or some you know some experienced um, colleague to help them write and so yes, I encourage collaboration. And for those young, especially young ones, they should look for people around the world to find. You know, it doesn't matter where it's from. Just you know, find in the area. You Google them, and then approach them proactively. Approach those in the field, in the same in the area to collaborate. And then through the collaboration, you learn. So I can tell you. So my mentor was at Woodside, and he trained me very hard, like a, like a boot camp. That type of training, like he made me write from a morning 5 a.m. to like 12 a.m. every day. So I I used to, you know, used to take me a, um, like six months, one year write a paper. Now I can write a full paper three days. He trained me. So that's the by collaborating with him, learn and learn from him. And I, I you know, sometimes I copy him. 
the way I write, and then I just like progressively, and you know, and then I get to, I, you know, I just get to very fast and good and efficient. So collaboration is really good. You learn, and then make your paper more publishable, and at the same time, you know, improve the quality, and also open up more opportunities. So proactive approaching. That's my advice. Gary, oh, hold sorry. on, wait a minute. Uh, Gary, I think you are one of the most uh, innovative person on this area, uh, and I've been <laughs> I've been watching you in the last uh, five years and your progress as a researcher yourself. And again, you know, I'm I'm keen to learn from the young people on on this area. So, what's your approach to this? Um, okay, uh, my 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 advice is this: Yeah, uh, sometimes for young researcher, when you write an email to some of these well-known authors, and you say, "Can I collaborate with you?" Uh, I will say that the chances is probably eight out of ten will actually say no to you. Okay, unless you really have a very very good profile. So I I feel that it's very important that you need to build that kind of human touch. Okay, in the sense that you should, you know, take the opportunity, you know, to attend conferences, you know, to meet the editor, to meet those well-known people, have a face-to-face -face conversation with the person so that they know who you are, show your sincerity, you know, show them that you really want to, you know, excel in this academic world and ask them for an opportunity. I think when someone actually sees you in person, face-to-face, -face, they will be more willing, I would just use the word more willing, to actually give you an uh, opportunity, you know, to, to collaborate. So my suggestion is uh, try to go and attend more conferences, you know, uh, events and etc. Yeah, uh, on my final advice to all these young uh, researchers, um, I, I share with you, um, you know, when I started as an academician many, many years ago, I constantly get a lot of rejection. In fact, I have one paper that got rejected almost two years over eight to nine different journals. But finally, the paper got accepted and the paper, in fact, was also highly cited. So my suggestion to all is that never give up. Okay, if your paper get rejected, it's fine. Continue and continue and continue to keep trying because your paper eventually will find its home. Just do not give up. Yeah. Thank you. Let, let, let me answer this now because of um, what Gary said. and and. People know that I'm constantly on the road and I'm meeting a lot of young academics in different conferences all over the world. And and inevitably, a lot of people come to me or they send me an email afterwards and say, hi, professor, I'd like to collaborate with you. I would like to publish with you. I would like to do that. And I'm trying to encourage people to do this. And I'm trying to encourage people to, to do well in their career. But uh, my time, my day has got 48 hours. Uh, I don't sleep. Uh, occasionally, I drink or eat. Uh, but you know, I, I it's 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 an incredibly busy busy life. So I would normally say when people say I'd like to collaborate, I'm asking three or four questions. What have you done? Why is that important? Why it has never happened before? And if you pass this kind of little test, and if they tell me interesting things. I'll say, okay, I'm interested in 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 this. Also, uh, quite often people are telling me things that I know nothing about. They've they've never seen what I do. They just want to publish with someone who is uh, well cited or has been around for a long time. And I said, look, if you are coming to me to talk about sustainability, you're not going to go very far away. It's not my area of expertise. So, but if the, if you come and talk to me about sustainability and smart tourism, then I'll look into this. And then I'll say, okay, give me, give me what you've done. What's your draft? Wh where are you now? So a lot of people think that, you know, if you've got a, a, a well-known author, your paper will be accepted. That is not the case because, because the, ref the reviewers do not know who has written the paper. I, I still get a lot of my papers rejected. So it's always about, have you progressed your thinking and... Can I make a contribution to what you are doing? And would it be cost effective for me in terms of time? You know, I'm not going to rewrite the paper. I'm not going to sit down and develop everything from scratch. It, but I, I'm keen to make a contribution uh, to someone who can. And, and typically in my situation, I, I help people shape the argument 
and make sure that they understand what is the novelty of their argument, if there is a novelty about, about the And I think that is my biggest contribution, if you like, when I'm approached. Noel, you want to say something, but I, I kind of interrupt you. That's right. Um, uh, I, I, do, I get approached often to help people with a paper. And what I've found uh, is that the amount of help I can make um, uh, is uh, the, the, the contrib my contribution is very little if there's already a draft of the paper available. Um, the most contribution you can make is before the research project starts, because that's where you're conceptualizing it, where you're looking at current ideas, where you're identifying a good question. Most of the papers I'm asked to work with are papers which aren't, don't have good questions. So if you want to, um, if you want to work, for example, in an area I'm interested in, it, it has to be in my area and it has to be something where um, you're willing to accept my ideas because I have particular ideas about things. And then, um, but, it, and, and it's at the beginning of your research, not at the end. Thank you very much, Noel. That's very, very important because some people are coming to you with a paper that has been rejected five times and they say, can you please save it, Professor? I said, y y no. Um, you know, um, Peter? Um, I think I'll address the second question. What advice would we give to, to, to early career researchers uh, about writing? Uh, writing is a skill. Um, it's a skill that you have to develop. So start early. Um, seek feedback in, in every single one of our universities at whatever level you happen to be at. There are peers or groups or uh, some sort of facility that will allow you to share um, underdeveloped papers and get feedback from your peers within the university or you set up your own network of peers to actually uh, try and seek that feedback. Um, and uh, as Demetrius said, I think it was um, get ready for a rejection, but take that rejection on board and use it to improve the, the paper and subsequent papers. And the other piece of advice I would give to ECRs is uh, try, try to pick an area, try to pick a specialization. Noel mentioned it earlier on there. He said, you know, it has to be in my area. Um, I see quite a lot of people who try to float and try to be generalists and do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And at the end of the day, you know, they're not tomato soup, they're not cauliflower soup, they're, they're, they're kind of vegetable soup, which really isn't very attractive to anybody. Absolutely. And I, I, I think the best advice I can give to people, the uh, ECRs is, uh, young researchers, is to make sure that they read the tourism review in detail, very frequently, that they, review for tourism review so they can get the understanding of what um, uh, good reviews uh, like and, and make sure that they understand the whole ecosystem, how the whole ecosystem works. Actually, uh, to be concerned, sorry, uh, just, just to interrupt, you know, that's something that I've, I've been thinking about doing is um, having an online presentation where people discuss a paper. Um, and criticize it and and learn from each other about how other people criticize papers. I think that would be a good idea to have as a uh, another a journal um, uh, online presentation where but beforehand we would share a paper and perhaps one and uh, 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 and and then we discuss it and analyze it. So then people learn how to do reviews and things. Fantastic. Or, or have two or three papers in similar areas and mm. do it and, and look into uh, look at, uh, what's good practice. Thank mm. you for volunteering for doing that, Noel. Uh, and, and, and Gary, thank you for volunteering for hosting this. That will be a, ni a very nice idea. And that's a way forward for our uh, webinars as well. Uh, let's close here by saying thank you to all our colleagues. Uh, thank you for all the people who have been uh, with us. Uh, I've seen so many people um, who have stayed even to the end. I don't know about you, but two hours passed very quickly um, and the conversation kept us going. 
I'd like to um, thank Rosita uh, from Emerald in Asia and Gary, uh, Professor Gary Tan in particular for organizing that and bringing us all together and Tete helping on in, in her sleep as well because he has been doing that. And also Catherine, Noel and Peter and Simon who has been trying to get on, on online but his computer um, uh, was not helping him uh, this morning. Um, so thank you very much guys, thank you for your contribution and uh, thank you for supporting the Tourism Review uh, in, in bringing excellence and, and bring young people from around the world in, in, um, in, in, in this uh, ecosystem. Appreciate it, thank you very much, have a good evening, morning, day, wherever you are.